Okay, guys. So I guess we'll get started. Um, just to give you some ground rules here, you guys have any questions, feel free to jump up, grab a mic. Um, another thing that we're going to be doing in this session is on your phones, if you go to the URL that you see at the top of the slides here, you can enter a question. Um, if you guys see questions from your colleagues that are in there uh, that you like, you can up upgrade it to high priority. We'll see it here and we can actually bring it in and put it on the screen and discuss those topics. So you have two options. You can go to the mics, ask questions, or you can use the URL and post it up there. We'll leave the URL up there for as long as you know, makes sense. And um, yeah, let's get started. So my name is Eric LaJoy. I'm with Red Hat, um, coming from the telco vertical. I'm actually out of Germany in Munich, but I'm originally from Boston. Um, and one of my uh, colleagues here. Hi. My name is Tapit Ankre, and I work at Nokia, and um, I'm a lead architect. Out of Finland. Flew all the way <laughs> yes, in from. I uh, what yes. Is it Espo or Helsinki? Espo. Espo, yeah. I can't even pronounce it right. <laughs> so you, you can see our pictures here. So uh, ah, I like that. Is that your wedding photo? Might be. I don't yeah? know. Did you borrow Doctor Who's bow tie there? Or? I need to get myself a scarf. I think that's what I need. <laughs> I didn't have to tie it myself. That was ready made. <laughs> nice. Cool. So who here in the audience has done RTKVM? Or let's even expand it, DPDK. Anyone? Okay. Okay, so we got maybe 20% in the room have done that. How many have done um, NFE telco type workloads in their experience? Okay, so it's almost a one-to-one. -one. So the 20% here, maybe minus a couple of you have NFE exposure and you're doing this. So just to give a precursor to this, DPDK, I would say is definitely an NFE type of uh, environment. Oh, and uh, for anyone that's just come in here, there's a URL at the top of the slides here. Free field, feel free to open that in your phone and just start typing in questions. We'll see it come up here on our laptop. And if you see ones from your friends or colleagues that are uh, actually putting them in, we can bring them up on screen and discuss them. And feel free to interrupt us at any point. Yes? Which one? So, so I didn't hear it. Ah, wait, you don't no, work for Red Hat? I thought this was Red Hat. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, get out of here. <laughs> All right, let me fix that. I saw that in here earlier. Uh, let's see. Anyone? Oh. Okay. All right, now you should be able to. Thank you. First time doing this, so. Does it work? Yes, okay. That was actually our secret filter, so we didn't have to answer any questions for you guys, so. Oh, we have a question. Oh, we do. Good. <laughs> uh, I co we're going to download that. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this. This is the agenda you'll see. So when you guys walk out of the room today, you're gonna have an idea of what RTKVM is, uh, what it means to, to, to have a real-time uh, need. And we have a big question for you at the end that we'll get to. Um, but basically, you're going to realize that there's two levels of RT, and Tapio here is going to go through a lot of that. So Tapio? Yeah. So the question is, why do we care? Why do we go care about the real-time performance of, of a hypervisor? So if you talk about, think about like VNF applications, they need to have predictable and fast performance. So I did a little calculation again. So if you have a 25 gigabit uh, interface uh, and you have 48,064 byte packets, it takes one millisecond to get that. So if you're doing something, if your CPU is doing something for one millisecond, that's the amount of packets that you risk losing. Okay. Go ahead. Mm. Now, if with RTKVM, DPDK, and some of the NFE features we talked about, uh, are going to talk about today, this is going to give you kind of a big picture, and I apologize for some of this being simple for you, that, uh, the 20% here that have already done this. So the way to think about this is you have a hardware level, then you've got the open stack or operating system level, and then you get your application running on top of open stack. What you're really going to look at here is RTKVM has a special uh, place in the open stack environment. And there's a special reason you want to use it. And again, back to the end of the slides here, we're going to ask you a big question at the end, which is really going to help the community and help us you know, figure out how in, in Red Hat, for example, 
we need to drive the RTKVM functionality and feature set. Um, what you're seeing here is that at the hardware level, you typically see a re hard requirement for the type of NIC you have, um, as well as the kind of the BIOS settings. So there's like an OPNFE group called uh, um, KVM for NFE. And you go there, and specifically, you can see all the BIOS settings you need to tweak today, best practices, to be able to do RTKVM and have the lowest, uh, let's say, jitter or latency in it, the time it takes to run a process. So th this sounds a little bit dry right now, but these are good pieces to store away as data points, and it'll kind of come together as we go through the slides. At the next level, you get your operating system. And in there, you're going to see there's the hi hypervisor requirements. So you have your RT in the host OS. You know, how do you pr uh, serve processes in the right order, the right priority? And then you have your RT in the uh, guest OS. So does your guest actually have RT requirements? Gazoom type. Uh, then you get your virtual switch. So if you want to avoid stuff like um, hard interrupts or v, uh, VM exits, or, or the, I'm just throwing these words out because if you haven't seen them before, you'll need to hear them, and then they'll make more sense once you see them. These are the type of things you want to avoid. So running like DPDK in user space with vhost user and basically bypassing the whole hard interrupt uh, kind of structure inside of uh, Queen KVM, you, you're having less and less of these kind of interrupts. It interrupts that's kind of recursive there, your RT uh, experience with the VM. Then at the top of your application level, what in the VM needs RT? Are you going to be running uh, EPC? Are you going to run Volt or IMS? Are you doing RAN, you know, RNC, Node B? This stuff may sound foreign to folks that are in the telco space, but you could also apply this to other IT spaces. What, when your application needs to have immediate or consistent uh, response, so if you're running something that has a clock, or say we're all talking to each other over an IP protocol, and there has to be a timestamp, and, and if I send you something and it takes longer than a set amount of time to reach you, then we're considering it uh, invalid. You want to have a consistent uh, uh, performance out of the VM to be able to send those. So here's some other stuff that's good to consider. So this comes back to the hardware level, and we're working up. So you've got uh, some features in Xeon process. And I apologize for anyone from AMD here. We don't have anything for that, but this is mainly from the Intel perspective. You have stuff like Resource Director Technology, or RDT. So this is, uh, if you look on the right, there's kind of a mapping of what this is. RDT is allowing you to cut up like your L3 cache and consistently serve it to the application that's above in the, in the running on the core. So this is another technology that allows you to get consistent behavior fr from your kind of processing delay and the timing it takes. I already mentioned the KVM for NFE, but that's really coming down to the BIOS settings. One example would be you buy Dell, you buy Cisco, you buy Supermicro, whatever you buy, make sure the EFI or the BIOS, whatever's running the uh, lower level uh, startup of the machine, has the functionality to turn on and off the features that are listed in that uh, project in OPNFE. VT-D is another thing. Most of the hardware has it today. But you're absolutely going to need that. So you'll be fine if you're running Xeon, but if you're any, running some kind of consumer i5, i3, i7 CPUs, you want to make sure you have that functionality. And then the last one, which is, is really the kicker here. So one of the things that's really bad for RT, or real time, is these hard interrupts. And if you have ILO, or uh, kind of remote management of a server, a lot of the time that thing's doing hard interrupts to your system and to, to do some sort of polling or, or update for, for the GUI or the graphical interface for your remote console. That was a big issue in some of the hardware. And also SMI. So that's another thing that does a hard interrupt to your uh, underlying uh, application. So you want to kind of look at these. So each, each hardware vendor probably has a different behavior of this hardware in their system, even though they'll all have it. So it'll be based on what firmware they're using, how it behaves. And it, it'll be really good for you to, to look at those uh, behaviors when you're doing a hardware selection. OK, we have a question. Hmm? I think I... Oh, sorry. So yeah, we have a, I'd like to take this audience question uh, now. So is RTKVM available now, and can VNS be deployed with RTKVM in an OpenStack environment? Answer is yes. Uh, so if you take the open source way, uh, I represent the OPN, OPNFV community, and there's a, a project that was actually already mentioned, this uh, KVM for NFV, that they are taking the uh, real-time Linux 
and, and real-time KVM and sort of packaging that, and it's all available, it can be installed and used. And I also heard that some of the commercial operating systems might have some real-time features. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. But uh, being from Red Hat, I'll uh, refrain from mentioning those. Uh, but there are some out there. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll leave it there. They're, they're pretty good too, but they're uh, proprietary. We'll leave it at that. So if there were open source ones and that are upstream, I'd mention them. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll go a little bit deep about KVM and what has to do with, with OpenStack and how do you actually get this real time performance with KVM? Because it's like, it just happens by, by magic, sort of. And I sort of, I go a little bit technical here, but then it's just sort of a, give you an understanding like what, is the, what are the challenges and, and sort of how does RT, KVM, RT Linux handle this? So the, the big story, of course, I mean, the question is, what does KVM have to do with, with OpenStack? So, I mean, the story, of course, is that there's this Nova controller, and then on the compute host, you have the, the Nova compute, and the Nova is telling the Nova compute to do something. You usually have a, a compute driver configured in the Nova compute, and that is talking to a, uh, a process called libvirt D, and the libvirt D is actually sort of hiding the specifics of the hypervisor. And in the case of KVM, uh, the, the libvirt D is, is uh, launching a process called QEMU, uh, which is, has its sort of a counterpart in the, in, as a kernel module called KVM. And then there's this uh, interesting sort of a communication mechanism between the QM and, and IO, uh, KVM, which is called IOCTL. And I'll show some examples about this, and, and I hope it, hopefully it becomes clear why, why this is sort of relevant here. So there's this QM part, that's the user space component, and that's sort of like, that creates the virtual machine and creates the abstraction of, of the hardware, whatever exists there. And the KVM is, uh, it's like, it's an optimization. It's, uh, it's speeding up a few things. And uh, so you have this user space component and then there's the kernel component. And as I said, they have a communication link between them. So QM implements most of the virtual devices, but then there's this uh, performance critical parts such as the CPU. And of course the KVM doesn't emulate the CPU. KVM makes it possible that the virtual machine code is running on the CPU without any emulation. It's just, it's running exactly the same code, the same instructions, except a few system calls. Then you have things like timers, interrupts, memory management. I mean, the, really the core performance critical stuff is happening inside of the KVM. And then if you think about like what happens when you, when you get the packet coming in, uh, this is the picture. So first of all, a couple of things that are sort of enabled in the, at least, well, in the sort of x86 type hardware. And I'm sorry, I, I don't really know how, how it works with the ARM uh, CPUs. So, top you, who, who here knows what APIC is? Okay. I'm counting really like four, pe uh, five people in here. Okay. Well, I can't count you guys twice, but well, let's do it. Okay, so six people. Anybody want to take a guess of what the APIC is actually doing here? Any? Sorry? Yeah, yes. that's good. So we get the IC. It's programmable interrupt controller. Yes. So I think it's going to be really important for you guys to take this away that what Tapi is talking about here is is really the, the green blocks here are important to understand. So when you start taking out the basics, would you agree, Tapio, that this, this diagram here is really where you need, would be a good place to start? Yeah, OK. So, <laughs> right. So what I was saying is actually there's that. So in a physical machine, you have this, uh, when a packet comes in, you get sort of the interrupt, and then interrupt is mapped into something else, and that is the, the role of the APIC. Uh, and then basically it goes, I mean, in, in the case of the virtual machine, you have the virtualized APIC and that, then the interrupt goes into interrupt handler in the, in the virtual machine. And when the, as for the sort of the data path, the, the, the content of the, of the packet when it comes in, it's, it's sort of copied from the NIC to the memory in the virtual machine 
And then, of course, you need to know where in the virtual machine memory you have to copy it. And then there's this virtualized device called IO MMU. And it all looks very good. And it's pretty clever system how it works. And, and yeah, he has actually, so just to keep my, myself honest, I, I launched a nice little VM and I just actually spied a little bit what it's doing. And I took some screenshots uh, as from the results. So I basically just booted up a, a, a virtual machine uh, on a Linux computer. And, and then I did this, just checked what kind of processes are running. I mean, what, what does the QM process actually, which is the virtual machine, like I said? What does it do? And as you can see from the top picture, is there's, a, there's a number of threads. There's like six threads. I have four virtual CPUs in my virtual machine. So you, have, you see these four uh, threads, uh, which are called KVM, virtual CPU block. So, those, so the, the QM starts, starts running the, uh, the code, and then this, uh, the thread actually goes to sort of this special mode, the, the hypervisor mode. And then I was actually looking at sort of what is happening inside of that, that, uh, that thread. So I, I did this S trace which allows me to spy the system calls that are happening. So th then you can see that this, um, uh, this thread 11866, which was one of the virtual CPU threads that is actually now doing this IO control uh, KVM run. So it's, it's running the KVM code. Would you like to take a question, Tapio? Uh-huh. I need my... Does the virtual APIC found in most in, uh, Intel CPUs take away the emulation part of interrupts in the VM? Oh, come um, on, anonymous? Come on, who did that one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a, yeah, the, the, the V APIC is doing, is doing the, uh, I don't know how to answer this quickly. Or you answer what. it all. <laughs> no. Okay, so this question is very good. Is there anyone in the room who can answer before we say we're going to take this one offline? Okay. No, it doesn't. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, VAPIC, uh, of course, is not available uh, universally. You have. Uh, uh, not only Intel processors, but AMD processors, which have similar technology, which involved only recently invented production. But uh, answering this exact question, yes, if you run VAPIC, you, uh, you can achieve, or you can try to achieve almost zero VM exits, and uh, you, how to say, you don't need emulation, I guess. Yeah, but my understanding is you still get the VM exit when you get an interrupt into it's thread. a discussion topic, I guess. We, we can talk to you after yes the no. presentation. Yeah. But okay. I mean, that's, that's not the, really the, yeah. This is good. So what was your name? Um, can you do it in the mic? Oh, sorry. Valentine. OK, perfect. So I, I, if you can stick around afterwards, I'd like to talk to you, because this is a data point we need to capture, because um, I haven't seen this topic come up before myself. And if there's anyone in the room that's interested in this well, Let's make sure we gather together after the session. We'll have time, and we'll figure this out. Because that, that sounds like another bullet we need to put in as a benefit here. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so this is the second part of the, of the spying. What I did was I was actually, yeah, I was actually looking at this, this interrupts things, what is, what is happening. I didn't look at the VM exit counter. I should have done that probably to get the precise answer of, do you still get the VM exit with, all, with each packet? But I mean, with this uh, sort of a vert IO interface that I was using, I set up a ping, and every time I got the message in, a message out, uh, there was an IO, uh, a sort of a MSI interrupt going to the KVM process. But anyway, it's all very clever, all very optimized, so what can go possibly wrong? with this system, and why do we need this real-time KVM at all? I mean, everything is, is optimized, right? You get the packet in, you get the interrupt in, nothing can go wrong, right? 
Nothing at all. It well, always works. <laughs> hopefully nothing goes wrong. But anyway, I mean, as, as I was trying to make the point that this, um, this is sort of a, everything is happening, uh, sort of the, the host operating system in the end is responsible for orchestrating all of this. So packet comes in, it, ha it has to go to the QME process, uh, somehow has to know that there's this packet that has to, that has to be handled. The, you have to forward this interrupt uh, to, the, to the virtual machine, to the KVM thread, and so forth. So if there's a latency, if there's any delay in, the, in this path, then you get latencies in the virtual machine, and especially you get latencies in the, in the packet processing in the virtual machine. And that is the role of the, of the real of the real-time Linux and, and the KVM. So it, the, what, what the real-time Linux is mainly is, it's the preempt RT patch. And what does, that does is that it tries to minimize the code in the Linux kernel that is preemptable. And then it has a, a few, few other things that it does that, that the project creates. It's like the, the high resolution timers and so forth. Anyway, the, the key idea is that you sort of uh, you don't block the processing at any point. You allow the packets to flow directly with as little delay as possible. And I have a little example about this, uh, like what can go wrong if you disable the interrupts in the, in the C CPU processor for too long. So in this picture, you have a number of processes waiting to, to, to sort of to, to, to reach some, uh, okay, thanks, uh, to, to reach some critical resource, and there's a, there's a long line, and there's, we actually have a very high priority process. What's going uh, on there? Very critical, yeah, he looks angry, because he's, there's this long line before he gets to, to or she gets, or maybe he uh, gets. Oh, so to, that's the end of the line, it's not the first line. You no, know, that's the end of the line, yeah, he's, okay. yeah. The, <laughs> The critical resources on the right hand side. Did you do this, or did you have your, your kid do this? I'm not that good in drawing, so <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I had an expert do this picture. So. I, I need to hire him for my next <laughs> presentation. That's good. Yeah, uh, yeah. All right. So he's very angry. He's not getting served. He has to wait. Uh, so what does he do? I mean, we have a priority inversion here. We have a high priority customer who's not getting served. So now he gets mad. <laughs> Eyes get blue. What does it do? It's actually passing the line. So that's the idea, basically. The, in the, the priority inversion uh, is, is avoided by sort of uh, preventing anybody blocking a critical resource, which could be spin lock or it could be any, anything like that, RCU, whatever, and, and sort of make it preemptible so that if something high priority happens, that high priority gets service first and then everybody else has to wait. And now there's, this picture is also nice because it sort of illustrates the downside of this. So you are not making the line go any faster by preempting the processing. You're actually making the line go, fa go slower. And then in the scheduling theory, we have this technical term called fairness. And this is not the situation that you would call fair. So it's like, it's priority based. So whoever's this highest priority has to go first. And there's no guarantees that the other guys ever will get anywhere in the line. But then, anyway, can I go forward? Mm -hmm. Ah, hold on. Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh yeah. So um, just a little bit picture about. So now we talked about like what, what are the, the latencies? Um, how do you get the latencies? So this is the, just an example about like how, how do you measure latencies? So the of course, what you're really interested in is sort of sending packets to the virtual machine and then measuring how, how long it takes to, to get them served and, and doing that for 24 hours and so forth. There's a very simple tool that I just want to mention here, uh, which is very much used in this sort of uh, real-time real -time Linux area. It's called Cyclic Test. And the idea in the Cyclic Test, if you're not familiar with that, is that uh, you set a timer which is firing every 10 milliseconds. And then the guy who is 
the, the process that is, gets woken every 10 milliseconds, so sort of whenever it wakes up, it writes down what is the time now. So it looks at the real time clock. It looks this is at in the a time. VM, right, Tapio? Sorry? This is inside the VM, right? Yeah, this, this, mm. you should do this inside of the virtual machine, yeah, to find out like, how much latency you're getting from the underlying host platform. Yeah. Has anyone here done cyclic testing before? One person. OK, so this, this is important. So imagine this. Put yourself in this set. You've got your OpenStack environment. You've got RT, KVM turn on in the environment. You've got a VM sitting in that environment. Let's say you've got use, vhost user running for your packets for your data plane. And now inside the VM, you're running RT as a, a real-time operating system. And now you've got yeah. an application doing cyclical testing. And this is what Tapia is talking about here. Yes, precisely. And, that's the, and, and then since your VM is real-time, you have an idea that this, there's not going to, much going on, sort of interfering <laughs> in, in the virtual machine side. So whatever latency, whatever jitter you get in the scheduling, it's probably due to the hypervisor layer and the host operating system. And that's how you measure it. So ideally, you want the timer to fire every 10 millisecond. But it, of course, it could be, there could be sort of variation jitter. Here's a good use case for you. Let's say we're all sitting in a giant elevator, and we're on the 100th floor of some skyscraper. And that elevator is running an application that requires a timer to tell you how long it takes to get between each floor and tells it based on your velocity. So it has to be very uh, consistent and very accurate. And let's say we want to go all the way to the first floor. But somehow there was a workload running in the same OpenStack cloud that was taking up resources and causing a delay in the real-time application to be processed. What would happen if we went two seconds over getting to the last floor? We'd probably be very, very flat at that point. So a good use case would be, OK, what applications are actually holding human lives in their hands when they're running? And I guarantee you're going to find a use case for RTKVM there. Public transportation, elevators. In the telco space, it's probably anything that uses signaling on the RAN side. Um, and again, that question we want to ask at the end, we're looking for feedback from you guys in the room where you see RTKVM requirements, because we want to make sure that every use case is in the community upstream code for RTKVM. So, OK. So this is the command line to run the cyclic test. Um, and then the nice thing is you can get this kind of like diagram graph it out, like what is the, how much jitter, how much delay you get for this interrupts, and you can sort of map it and look at the micro, uh, sort of how many microseconds you're delaying. And now you, here you're interested in sort of, there's a few outliers, some very long times, so you're interested in like what is the cause, what, what, what caused those things, but mainly you're interested in sort of like where is the mass, what sort of, where do you draw the line, like when does the, I mean, to sort of to tell how good your platform is, you look at like 99.99 percentile on this curve. So like, what is the point where 99.999 percent of the, of the interrupts, uh, of the latencies are below that line? And just a little caveat that you have to take into account is that when you're doing this measurement, then it's very important that you also have some load. So a lot of the systems, when you're running the testing, then if it's unloaded, you get very good performance, very good latencies. But then, of course, once you start having load, you can have a network load, CPU load, uh, storage load, things like that. That can actually sort of mess up the scheduling. And then you start getting, getting higher latencies. And of course, the benefit of, of the RT, KVM, RT Linux is that these latencies don't get higher as you get more load. OK. OK, so what we have here, who, who knows what a flavor is? Come on, please have every hand up. OK, good. <laughs> OK, so who can tell me that they've done these attributes in a flavor? Oh, cool. We actually have three people in here. Ah, Mohammed, I know you've done it. So he works for Red Hat, and he's actually done a RAN VM on top of OpenStack and helped do performance testing with DBDK, right, Mohammed? OK, yeah. So the thing to take into account here is what, what we're showing here is you have attributes that you can set in the flavor for the VM. So the one way to think about it is if you're running a cloud and you want the 
user of the cloud not to be able to use RT unless they're allowed to, then one way to do it is create a flavor and only let the users you want to be able to do RTM have access to that flavor. What this is telling you here is the first thing is saying, yes, allow this VM to use real time. So this means RTKVM is running. And then the next piece you have here is the mask. Now this is saying CPU zero in the VM. So this isn't the physical CPU core. This is the virtual core in the VM. And you're saying, because remember, when you're doing a real-time operating system, you still need a, a core in the VM to run the non-real-time applications. So you know, your, your, um, your cron jobs or your mail, your SNMP, all that stuff would be in the non-real-time process. So you always need more than one C virtual CPU when you're doing real-time. So minimum two. Here, you could define uh, um, power to one, and that would make your second CPU your non-real-time. But by default, most operating systems will choose CPU zero for most of the services. So what we're showing here is, OK, the, VM's a lot, the VM that gets created via flavor, ooh, good echo. Um, we get an echo there? Get echo, echo. OK. And we get to work on that one. Get some sound effects going in here. OK, so, so what, what we've got here is you typically want to have this type of setup. What's, what's also nice is default, it will be zero. So if you left this off the flavor and just said real time, it would still leave saying zero is your non-real time. Then you'd want to have uh, your other CPU doing your real time, and you need to make sure your application that's doing real time is knows that it should be running on virtual C, or it's, it sees it as physical CPU one. Um, the other thing that we're not saying here is we're assuming you know about NUMA. So he, who here knows about NUMA and what it is? Yes. Okay. So. This assumes you know NUMA. Let's say you've got a two-socketed system. You've done CPU isolation, all the background stuff that has been talked about in many sessions in the summits across the last couple of years. You've also got huge pages because you're using DBDK and you're assigning a huge page to this. Let's say you've done all that tuning and optimization. At this case, you're, let's say you're running on the same NUMA node for both cores, and one's doing Z core zero, virtual core is doing all your non-real time. And then whatever your real-time application, it's using one and then X number that you've added on top of that. So you can actually um, usually only have one here as your non-real-time, and then the rest would be serving up your application. Is that clear? Is there anyone who's got any questions that you can throw up or just ask verbally here? Cool. OK. Anybody want to go to the Fenway and get some beers and food? Yeah? OK. Let's try and not hold you guys back. Maybe we can stop a little bit earlier today. Um, we have a question which may not be a question, actually. OK, Ajay, should I put this one up? OK, I'll just let you know. So Ajay and I know each other. We worked at Cisco together back a few years ago. I, I call him Mr. MPLS and Mr. IPv6, but uh, yeah. He's one of our telco experts in Red Hat. So if you have any telco questions, Go see Ajay. You can see his picture here at the bottom, so you know who he is. <laughs> and he's written a nice NFE architecture document. So if you're doing stuff that's related to NFE, talk to Ajay. So let's see what we got here. No, it just says that if you have, uh, the way I understand it, you have a RTK VM and obvious TPDK, you get zero packet loss. Hmm. Value add. Anyone have an application that needs zero packet loss? Maybe a routing protocol that would go down and lose all its routing tables if it missed a packet, anything like that. Maybe medical stuff, it would stop the insulin injection if it lost a, again, well, the networking one's not life-threatening, but the medical one would be. I have a next question for you. You want to take this? Should I deploy RTKVM in both ways? I mean, should you deploy RTKVM inside of, on the host and on the guest yeah, side? That's an interesting question. So I guess if we were to throw that back at you without making it a question, <laughs> not that I would ever do that, what would be the use case where you want to have the VM served in real time and the application in the VM doing real time? Let me put a cursor on that. Let's say the v virtual CPUs are all isolated CPUs in the host layer, meaning that there shouldn't be any other application using that core except for the VM. So far, the use cases, and again, I need you guys to give me feed, give Tabi and I feedback at the end about what you see as use cases. 
But so far, the main use cases we've seen, you turn on CPU isolation, there's not a huge benefit yet unless the application in the VM is real time. In that case, you want to give consistent prioritization at both the host layer and the VM layer. Yeah. But if you're not using RT in the VM, don't need it in the, in the uh, host layer. And in yeah. some cases, I think we've actually seen lower performance when it's only using RTK VM in, the, in, our, in your POC lab, I think, right? Mm. Well, anyways, uh, let well, me say this. So Mohammed, who's over here, we're going to see this on the slide. He's got a session tomorrow on how to actually implement RTK VM in OpenStack, all the configurations. And I, I don't want to ruin the surprise, but he's actually got the answer to that in hard numbers. <laughs> so you can either pick him up now and get the question, the answers from him, or you can go tomorrow to his session, which we'll show here in a little bit. Can I give the short answer to this question? Yeah. Yes. I mean, the latencies, of course, they add up. So you have to look at the sort of, like we had this stack, you have to look at the latencies in the hardware and the host operating system and the guest operating system. So yeah, you should optimize it. Optimize all of them. OK. So we already mentioned there's a, so RTKVM is one thing, real-time Linux, real-time KVM. That's one thing. There's also other, other tricks that you can do, already mentioned by Eric. You can isolate the CPUs where you're running the virtual machines. You can have CPU pinning. You can have pass-through to optimize the performance, because then you don't have this sort of a mess of communication between the host operating system and the guest operating system. You can have options in the operating system, such as turning on the no HS, HC option, no RCU callback, no memory check exceptions, such like that. But I don't think we should want to go in, in any more depth into this. You should really come. Let's, see let's let Mohammed do that tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah. Uh, so, just as a, a precursor there, it's actually done on uh, Red Hat OpenStack, so OSP. But you should be able to do this with any distribution because outside of the director stuff, the OSP director that you're covering, Mohammed, I'm pretty sure a lot of the other stuff will be down to kind of flavors and other options that are basically OpenStack agnostic. Um, you can see the session down here, so if you're interested. And um, again, we'll have some business cards up here, so if any of you guys want to share hey. your use cases together. Eric, yeah. we have one more question. Maybe you can ah. take this one. 42. Can I put the question here? Ah. Wait, 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 wait. The guy in the red shirt put that up here, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so answer is yes. Ah, here we go. We got one. Oh, How come well, everyone's doing anonymous? Is there ah. Yep, go for it. Uh, okay, it's actually not a question, but a correction to my not very, my incomplete answer to the v VAP question. Two issues here. First, uh, virtual IP doesn't virtualize corner ca case interrupts, so you still need an emulation. And then I agree with you that you probably can't achieve zero VM exit scenario with KVM. So now I feel better, thank you. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So uh, we have one more. Is there a link to see performance results with or without uh, RT parameters? And I think. Yes. So Mohammed yes. has that in his slides. Yes. So if you want the comparison of RT and non RT, both with DBDK, I think you even have different OVS versions one multi thread, one without. One OVS. OK. It's going to be one OVS at the end. Um, we'll be covering 2.5 OVS. Yeah. And by the way, in the, again, the OPNFE mentioned, there's, as I mentioned, there's this KVM for NFV project in OPNFE. Those guys have done a lot of presentations about what they've done, and they also have these measurement results. I can look up the, some, of the, some of the links to the, the slides that they have done. But yeah, they've definitely done this sort of, this kind of measurements that they have done that kind of measurements. I don't have it available right now. Cool. Great question so far. Very brave of you to all use anonymous. Yeah. Okay. OK, there's so my uh, pause of. Uh, this, this turned into a pretty long advertisement break for Mohammed's presentation tomorrow. But yeah. OK, so we're on the, we have one minute left here. Just uh, one more thing to, to, to show here is that. When we put the deck up on the YouTube video, it should be there. If, if it's not, then uh, 
what we'll do is if you guys want this deck, come up here and write your uh, email down on a pen and paper I have here, or you can wait for it to come out in the slides. I'm not too confident that we'll be able to get the slides on there because we actually have to send them to the OpenStack Summit board and then they attach them to the video. Um, so if, if you want to get them in this week, your weekend, put your email in a, in a, um, on the paper for us. The other thing too is that we have this last data point. So we have references here. So the first three links are actually for a RHEL version that's coming out uh, soon. Uh, I can't, I'm, can't really put a date on, but it, it's basically RT in the host OS. So there's an installation guide, a reference guide, and a tuning guide. So this would be one thing you want to look through for, for uh, doing it in OSP or RHEL. Uh, and then Mohammed has, of course, the o OpenStack pieces that go along with that. Um, and then basically our, our, a lot of, a uh, few other links here from Tapi and I that we thought were really good to share. So uh, more perspectives from people that just do KVM in their day-to-day -day work. So with that, thank you very much for your time. It was an uh, enjoyment for me. You too? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Enjoy the beer.